What's going on guys? We're having a great day today. Last week we looked at Job being physically afflicted. That before that his possessions such as his cattle, his, his livestock, his, his children, his servants, his property, they were all taken. That God had given the devil authority to take these things from Job because the devil accused Job of worshiping God only because of his possessions. That was in chapter 1. In chapter 2, we see that the devil actually physically afflicts Job. That he puts boils all throughout his body. And that Job is in deep agony. And at the very end of chapter 2, we see that Job and his friends are sitting there. And they sit in silence for seven days. Where Job no doubt pondered the reason of his existence. The reason why God has given him, him life. And I think we are supposed to actually sympathize with Job. And understand what Job is going through. That he has lost everything. He is in so much physical pain and affliction and unrest. And so as we read chapter 3 where Job breaks the silence and Job speaks about the cursing of his birth, it is important to note that Job is in extreme agony, both physically, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually. And that Job is speaking in a poetic manner. That he is speaking with very, many, very much figurative language and illustrations and, and a lot of exaggeration. So it's important that we understand the context of what Job has went through before he speaks in the manner that he does speak. And for this teaching, I've decided to read all of chapter 3. It is 26 verses long. I know it is a very lengthy chapter. But the whole chapter is really all the same. That Job is cursing the birth, the day of his birth. So as I read this, I encourage you just to, to hear Job's words, read his words. Understand what he is saying. Understand why he is saying these things. But then also understand that that not everything he says is necessarily correct. But he is speaking out of a place of, of misery, out of a place of despair. But as we read Job chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 26, focus on the attitude of Job. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, in the night in which it was said, There is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let God, not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let the darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined into the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that cursed day, who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilight therefore be dark. Let it look for light, but have done. Neither let it see the dawning of the day. Because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me, or why the breast that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept, then had I been at rest. With kings and counselors of the earth, which built desolate places for themselves, or with princes that had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Whereas in hidden, untimely birth I had not been, as infants which never saw light. There the wickedness cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together, they hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid, and whom God hath hedged in? For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. So the very first part of this, in verses 3 through 6, where Job says, Let the day perish when I was born. And then verse 4, Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Verse 5, Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. And in verse 6, Let it not come into the number of the months. We see that Job is lamenting his birth. He is cursing the day that he was ever born because of the misery that has been brought upon him. That he is not cursing God. We must understand this. and Because of this, Job, in, in a sense, still holds fast his integrity. He is not cursing God for afflicting him, for God allowing this to happen to him. But he is cursing his birth. And in that regard, in that sense, Job is indirectly accusing God in a sense. He's not straight saying that, that God is, is wrong for what he has done to me, but that he does not understand that God is who gave him life. He actually, he does understand that, but he says, let not God regard it from above, but that God has given Job life. God has allowed Job this, this beautiful life. And for Job to curse the day that he was born, 
in an indirect manner, he's really saying that God was wrong for allowing him to be born. So what Job is saying, again, it's poetic, it's emotional, it's, it's over-exaggerated. He, he, he is in grief, he is in despair, but what Job is saying in an indirect manner is very incorrect. That we should not curse the day that we are born, that God has given us life. This life is valuable, and this life is precious, and we are to use this life to glorify God. But again, I've never experienced what Job has ex- experienced. So of course, I am not in this an emotional agony as Job is. So I, I understand what Job is saying. And I, I really do sympathize with Job, but, but speaking in a, in a correct, objective manner, we should not curse the day that we were born because God has given us life and we should cherish this life. But then we see in verse 7 and 12 that, that Job wishes, he not only curses the day he was born, but he wishes that there was no joy in the day that he was born. He says in verse 7, Lo, let that night be solitary, let no joyful voice come therein. That he wishes that no one would even have joy over his birth. That obviously when a mother has a child, there is extreme joy. Because a mother is bringing a child into this world. Something that her and her, hopefully, rightly, correctly, her spouse have brought into this world. And so it's a joyful thing to give birth. But here Job says, let it no joyful voice come therein. And we all see in verse 10, he says, Because it shut not the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. That Job is grieving because of the trouble that he has experienced. And because of what he is experiencing now with his affliction, he wishes that he would have had no joy on the day of his birth either. And of course, Job is experiencing the most significant troubles. Like I said, I cannot even imagine what he is going through. But to say that there should be no joy for the birth of a child is very foolish. But again, Job is not a fool. Job is just... He's a human being. He's a man. And he's experiencing great agony. And we see something very interesting in verse 13, verse 19. Job is wishing that he would die. So that this pain, this agony, this grief would stop occurring to him. So if we start at verse 17, he says, There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor, the small and the great are there. And the servant is free from his master. Talking about whenever they die, they are free from whatever they are going through. That the prisoner can finally rest. The the small and the great, they are all there. That there is no one that is not there. And the servant is finally free whenever he dies. And so this is Job wishing that he could be as these people, that he could die. So that he could, could have rest. Could have some kind of pleasing thing happen to him. And, and what Job is saying is both true and both false. But there is a reality that obviously if you are a prisoner on earth and you die, you are no longer a prisoner. So therefore, in a sense, you are free. If you are a slave, you are no longer a servant to your earthly master. Because you are no longer alive, you, you pass into the, to the next life. But Job, where he is false, where he is foolish in this regard, is that this is not the case for every human being. That there is a reality that whenever we die, we... We either go to hell or we go to heaven. And that's all based off our belief in Christ. And so, sadly, this is not true for everybody. That Some people who are experiencing the worst of the worst here on earth, who are prisoners, who are servants, who are experiencing affliction after affliction after affliction, and they just want rest, and they hope to have it once they die, if they do not know Christ, they will be tormented in hell for all eternity. So this is not true. Their life at, in, after this world will be far worse than what it is upon this world. So what Job said is true. Like Job truly said this, but what he said is not true in to a full extent. Because this this is not the case for everybody, but for the for the Christian, for the one who believes in Christ, what you are going through now might be difficult, might be troubles. There might be many troubles, but knowing who Christ is, believing in Christ, we look forward to the glory that when we die, we will see Christ in heaven. We will be reconciled with our God. And all of our tears will be wiped for our eyes, as the book of Revelation says. And that we will be with God more fully. And we'll, we, we will be at rest. We will be at peace. But what Job says is not true for every single human being upon this earth. And it's very important to note that. But see, in verse 20 through verse 26, Job, after he has cursed his birth, he knows that he cannot go back into his mother's womb. And be reborn. Or go back into his mother, mother's womb and die. Job knows that he is stuck. 
in his situation. And so instead of actually wishing he would have died as a kid, as a child, as an infant, he desires that he would die now. In verse 20, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for more than for hid treasures, that he is searching for death. He wants death to come, but it does not come. He says, Which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. That there are people, and I do believe Job is saying in his category right now, who are just longing for death. That they rejoice when they find the grave. But see, the worst thing, Job is his, he's distraught physically, emotionally, and uh, mentally. But see, in verse 23, we see that Job is despaired spiritually. He says, why is light given to a man whose way is hid, and whom, whom God hath hedged in? That Job feels as though God has forsaken him. Now, I understand why he feels this way, but Job is incorrect in feeling this way. And I can understand why many of us, we might feel that way as well, that God has forsaken us. But God, He is all-knowing, He is all-present. And He says that He will never leave us nor forsake us. So to think that God would ever forsake you, while I understand in a difficult situation it might feel that way, know that God does not forsake His children. God will never forsake us. He is always with us. So His understanding is, is uh, or excuse me, his, uh, his feeling is understandable, but it is very incorrect. So the summary of this whole chapter 3 is that Job feels as though his life is meaningless. All he wants is to die. And who can really blame him after he has lost all these things? But to really, to deny the reason of your existence, to deny the purpose of why you are here, is to believe that God is ignorant, is to believe that God was wrong in creating you. And so because of this, what Job is saying, while again it's emotional, it's poetic, I don't think it's necessarily sinful, but it's downright foolish. At best, it's foolish. Because to question your existence is to question why God has created you. It's to question why God has, has made you for His His will, for His glory. But see, the, the thing about Job, while he was experiencing this, this grief, this sadness, in reality, God was using him to both sanctify him and to glorify God. That people like you and I, we can go back and read the book of Job, and we can be encouraged that here he is, a perfect and upright man that is being tested, that is going through tribulation, that is going through trials. But yet we see him, by the end of the book, we see hey, he makes it through the trials. So we can be encouraged by this. But we also see the goodness of God. That by the end of the book, God has given Job what he has lost. But he has given even more to Job. Now that's not really necessarily the point of it. But the point of it is that God is good. And through reading the book of Job, we can see that God is good. We can see that God is faithful. And we see that as mankind, we should be utterly dependent upon God. And God actually taught this to Job. He taught Job to rely more upon God. He taught Job that, that the, the ways of mankind is foolish, but that God is wise. And God is all-knowing. And so through this calamity, we, as we read this book, are, are, are encouraged. That we see a, a man who loves God, yet yeah, we see him struggle. We see him suffer. And I just want to let you know that the Christian is not promised an easy life in this world. That we are not promised prosperity. We are not promised everything in our life to go as we expected, everything good. We are not promised that. We are not promised that we will never face a single difficult task in our life. Instead, we are going to endure suffering. Now, it may not be as, as Job experienced. It may not be that severe. But it could also be even more severe. There are people who are are out there dying for the name of Christ, who are being persecuted, and they are losing their life. Unlike Job, Job did not lose his life, so so it is possible it could be worse. But if we read Romans chapter 8, verse 17 through 18, we see what Paul tells us. And we see that, that while we suffer in this world, we should glory in Christ. It says this in verse 17 of chapter 8 of Romans. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And in verse 17 he says that, And if children, then heirs. This is talking about people who are born again, who believe in Christ. That if you believe in Christ, you are a child of God. And that yes, we will face suffering. Because even Christ says that the world hates us. 
but it also hated him. It hated him first. And that's because the world practices wickedness. The world practices selfishness. And the world is very proud. The world is very sinful. And since we are born again, we believe in Christ. We hate wickedness. We hate sinfulness. And we tell the world the, the wrong that they're committing. We tell the world they need Christ. And because of that, the world hates us because they love their sin more than God. And that is why the world hates us. But we see that he says in verse 18, The sufferings at this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I know in our human nature, in our, in our flesh, it's so easy to focus on what is happening to us in our lives as Job is. Job is focusing on what is happening in his life physically right now. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, because obviously we are humans, we do see the here and now. But when we compare these sufferings, these trials, these tribulations, these afflictions, if we compare it to the glory that we will have one day when we are in heaven worshiping God, then there is nothing to compare. That if if a man were to live his life a hundred years on this earth, poor, broken, paralyzed, in prison, suffering, everything imaginable that could happen to this man, if that was his whole entire life for a hundred years, nothing could compare, if he was a born-again believer in Christ, nothing could compare to what it will be like when he is in heaven, healed, restored with God for all of eternity. For you have to understand that this life is short, but eternity is forever. So even a hundred years in this life is but a vapor, is but a very small, tiny, unseeable portion of eternity. And that's why Paul says that the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So to have eternal life, to have this great joy that we will one day be with God in heaven, we must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For the truth of the gospel is that we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all loved sin more than God. We have all once at one point been counted as an enemy against God. That God's wrath dwelt upon us because of our sin against a holy, righteous, loving, just God. But that God loved us enough to send His only begotten Son, that the Lord Jesus Christ humbled Himself. He put on flesh. He became a man. He lived a perfect, sinless, holy life, one that you and I could never live. And that He went to the cross, that no man could take His life from Him, but that Christ willingly laid His life down upon the cross. And while this perfect, sinless Son of God was upon the cross, He took upon Himself your sin, in my sin. And with our sin upon his shoulders, he took upon himself the wrath of God that we deserve. That he took upon himself God's wrath. And he satisfied the wrath of God. And Christ died upon that cross. He was buried. But on the third day, he rose again, proving that he is God. And that what he said is true. That if anybody would repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. It is not of works. It is not of of goodness. It is not anything that you or I could do, but it is all by the grace of Christ, all by the finished work upon Calvary that Christ accomplished upon that cross. And so, as Job mentioned, we can rest whenever we die, but for the unbeliever, there is condemnation. There is a reality of hell because Christ, if you do not believe in him, is no longer a propitiation of your sins, but that God's wrath is still remaining on you. That if anybody would repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. Always remember you are not alone. Jesus loves you. I love you. Have a blessed rest of your day.